Mexico City, about two hours. And uh, we're looking, we're in the highlands here. This is what would be considered a cloud forest, kind of a combination of oak and pine. And we're looking for a rare lizard that's found here. Uh, the name of the lizard is Abronia, which is a scientific name, but it's an arboreal alligator lizard. And we've got two biologists with us here today, Roberto Mora Gallardo and Rafael Aguilar. What we're looking for out here is a species called Abronia depi. And the Abronia depi is black and has little white dots on its back. So that's kind of the animal that we're looking for. It's about that long when it's full grown. Um, they're not common and it's not going to be easy to find them. But uh, we're hoping we've got a little sunshine today. It's right at the end of fall, so it's kind of cooling down. But we're hoping that we'll find some. So, just wanted to give an introduction to the day. We're going to start looking for these Zebronia and see what we come up with. got firewood there. That's a charcoal. Hold on, Wes. So this is what's happening here. We're in the cloud forest area. You saw that load of charcoal he's carrying out. Uh, a lot of the local people here use the forest. They cut down the trees. They burn out that, that wood and they use it to cook. So some of the best wood comes from Unfortunately, from these areas where there's not a lot of not a lot of habitat here for the abronia, so uh, it looks like there's a lot, but it's decreasing because of the the people that move in and kind of take away some of the wood. But that's the circle of life here. So. Here's a bromeliad that fell out of the tree. You can see it's still intact and still very alive. Sometimes we'll have little animals in them. It can be tarantulas, it can be scorpions, snakes. What we're looking for is a little lizard. These things sometimes blow down if there's a strong windstorm. I'm trying not to be too hard on a plant. Because it'll, it'll still survive and do fine here on the ground for probably quite some time. Uh, just taking a peek in here. It's going to be thorough. It's noticeably cooler just touching the plant and feeling the moisture that's in there. It's cooler inside the plant. And that's why the abronia use these plants because they can cool down a little bit. Plus, as you can see, it's like a, a maze. And there is a little bit of water in there. Here's a little bug. A wasp of some kind in here. I don't know if you can get in on that. So a little salamander. We don't know what kind it is. But it was in the bromeliad. It's got dirt all over it. <laughs> Second large bromeliad I found on the ground here, just a little area. So now I'm starting to think they probably were cutting trees down here. In fact, I see some pieces of wood, some branches laying around. So this is one of those areas where they have been cutting trees for firewood, and as a result, you get bromeliads on the ground. Um, oh, you can see right here is a great shot. Look at all the bromeliads in this tree right here. That's a great location for a bronia. That's where they want to be up there. We're not finding much here yet. We've been going for about two hours. Haven't seen a lizard yet. We did see one little uh, scoloporus, a little fence lizard, but it ran under rocks, so that's it so far. This is the way it goes sometimes, and we may not find anything. 
be disappointing to come all this way and not find anything, but uh, we're hoping in the next couple hours we get something. This is the time of day when they would be out. It's kind of like looking for a needle in the haystack though, for sure. There's so many hiding places there. This is a little snake. Synopsis. It's a genus. Uh, it's just a little ground snake that uh, gets eaten out here by just about everything. Les come los alacranes. Coral snakes. And los escorpiones se come. Ella. Arañas. Ella come, uh, alacranes. Uh, Rafael here is telling me that these guys are specialized eaters on uh, scorpions and spiders. Yeah. You can see the, uh, the scales underneath. Or yellow, or orange. Esto es lo que vas llevando. Como una grillera, ¿no? Como una trampa, ¿no? Little harmless snake. They do have mild venom in their rear fangs, but they're not prone to bite and it wouldn't hurt me, really. Maybe just irritate. Kind of like a stinging nettle. So it's not an abronia, but at least we found a reptile today. <laughs> okay. Gonna put them down Usually these are pink when they're larger. This is a juvenile tarantula. It's uh, cold. It's young. It's not going to hurt anything. Uh, they've got the little hairs on the back end that they can throw out and it'll itch. But uh, obviously Rafael doesn't doesn't care. Tiene experiencia con la tarantula. Sí. There he goes. Back goes home. So this is an adult. You can see by the size, it's quite a bit bigger than the than the little one that we found. Oy, look at those. Can you see the fangs? Look at the fangs on that guy. So this is a rose-haired tarantula. Uh, it's pretty common here in Mexico, but you have to know what you're looking for. It's endemica del eje neovolcánico. Uh huh. He said it's endemic to the uh, the Lejen volcano, um, the volcano here. They're really quite gentle. Doesn't seem to care that we're here, and doesn't seem to try to bite. He's gonna go back to his home here pretty soon. It's a female there. The male would be a little bit thinner in the rump. Yeah, he knows what to do to that. Watch him go back in there. <laughs> there we go. Okay. okay. We'll go ahead and cover him back up. He can come back out when he wants to. Well, that'll make some good footage for the spider people, but we still haven't found a bronia. That's what we'd like to find. So this is where we wash our hands right here. This is what you call a modern sink, 20th century. Right? Get a little soap right there. That's the soap, and this is the rinse. Now I'm good to go.
Except that I can't get the soap off my hands because it's cold water. That's a medieval sink right there. Pretty good stuff. We just had an authentic Mexican roadside taco meal. We'll see how it works. In a couple hours we'll know if we did okay. Hopefully we did fine. Right. Yeah, we spent a uh, good night here last night. This is our fine accommodation in a uh, little city here in Mexico called Chilpancito. That's where we're staying. You can see they paid the extra money in this area for the interior decorating. We don't really care. Once we fall asleep, it doesn't matter. But uh, I like the way they did the, uh, the power. Uh, it's just stapled to the wall very neatly like that. It's great. Uh, the beds were actually more comfortable here. But in the last place we stayed, the beds were kind of like a board that you laid on. And eventually it softened up and it worked out. But uh, anyway, this is just to give you an idea. The three-star conditions. Three stars. Is this, I gave this hotel three stars on a scale of one to a hundred. Anyway, we're moving on to the next place now. We like it here. We did. I'm standing in an oak. This is one of the typical oak trees in this area. And you can see all the epiphytes. There's a bromeliad. There's a little clump of orchids right down there. Wild orchids. Look at all the bromeliads through here. This is the kind of habitat that we're looking for. You know the abronia are found in this area. Uh, it's just a matter of actually seeing one. That might be the tough part, but this is just to give you an idea. It's very beautiful. Uh, the plants here that grow just wild. <laughs> Sometimes when we're looking for lizards, abronia, find other things. So here's a good example of that. I just lifted up this rock and there's a little bug in here. It looks kind of like a scorpion, but it's not a scorpion. It's something entirely different. It's called a vinegaroon. And these guys, basically it's a Stingerless scorpions it's got that little whip tail there. You see, it actually emits an odor that's similar to vinegar, so they call it vinegar. But you can see it's got these jaws on the front, and I could actually pick it up. It's not going to hurt me. And it will uh, get a good shot of that. That's a vinegar rune. They're actually pretty common, but we haven't seen one yet on the trip. So in our search for abronia, uh, one of the things that, that we have to consider is they're mainly up in the trees in the bromeliads, uh, maybe in tree hollows as well, but definitely off the ground. Uh, but what we found in, in our field studies here is that they sometimes can be uh, under rotten logs or in fallen bromeliads or even in the leaf litter. So that's why you'll see you know, Roberto and Rafa here shuffling through with uh, with the snake hook trying to find uh, at, at best they're trying to find a, a stray abronia that might have fallen out of the trees because it's not always easy to climb up a tree <laughs> bottom line it's a black widow but it has red on top it's a little different than the ones we see in the US
So this tree here that I'm about to climb up was hanging over a, about a 20 foot drop off. So I was a little cautious climbing up this thing, as you can imagine. But uh, it all turned out fine. Spider. I love when I find fast, ugly, nasty spiders that run after me when I'm up in a tree. That's my favorite. This thing looks like it's going to hold. I'm only 195. I've been working on that. I'm trying to get down to 180, but we'll see. Might take me three months of running. In the meantime, I just want this tree to hold. I'm trying to look for the abronia without doing too much damage to the bromeliads because I know this is a limited resource out here. I don't want to hurt them. Now it's time to get back down the hard part. Ready? Ah, that wasn't so bad. It's not a bronia, but this is a little anole that's found here. He was hiding in the litter. Just started hopping around. It's about the size of a bug. Cute little guy. I'm just gonna go ahead and put him back. This is where he was. He doesn't want to come back. There you go. This is a wild honeybee colony that we found, and uh, we certainly kept our distance because uh, we know that the Africanized honeybees are also found in this area. We're not sure which species this is. I'm no bee expert, but uh, it was interesting to see. This is a uh, Scalopris macronatus. Roberto found it. Uh, we didn't find any bronia yet, but we're getting good at finding everything else. So, you can see this guy's got a nice little collar, black and white there. Beautiful blue underbelly. He wants to run away. Just wanted you to see that blue. He's hiding his blue. You might want to bite me, let's see. Uh, ow! Ow! It does hurt a little bit. That's what a lizard bite looks like. <laughs> Gotta be careful. <laughs> see the little uh, teeth. Doesn't doesn't hurt anything. So this is a nice little blue scalopris. It's another lizard, but not the abronia, not what we we're looking for yet. We're trying to find a tarantula here. Roberto found it about an hour ago, took a picture of it, and it's got a bright orange and yellow marking on the back. Raphael thinks it might be a new species. So we haven't found any abronia today, but we're gonna try and make up for it by finding other things. Maybe this uh, tarantula will be something that makes the trip more interesting, if we can find it. So far, we haven't been able to. 
¿Y solo una quería esta? No, esta es otra familia. ¿No te sirvo? No. Y ahí se un montón de rato y hasta le puse la otra. La tapa de su corazón. Con ser de su nido. No debe descubrir que ya no quise saber nada. No debe de ser la única. So what we're looking at here behind us, this is the clouds rolling in. Sometimes they call this, this high elevation forest a cloud forest because quickly the uh, humidity can turn into clouds and a little wind can move in and you can see that cloud just starting to cover. And that humidity provides a lot of the epiphytes and bromeliads the moisture they need to grow here. So it's just a nice view of, of how it comes in in the evening. Uh, we didn't find the tarantula, by the way. We looked in the whole area that uh, Roberto had found it and we couldn't find it. We did get a photo of it, so we'll probably show that photo here in a little bit, but couldn't find the actual specimen. We're wrapping up here on the second day. No obronia yet. Two solid days of looking and we haven't found any. But we're all hungry. We haven't had lunch. I think we're going to go eat some dinner. It's about 5 o'clock. Got to drive back to town. I think it's an hour drive to town, so we're going to get going pretty soon. ¿A dónde vamos a hoy? El pozole, ¿no? Sí. ¿Sí? ¿A comer pozole? Sí. ¿Sole? El pueblo es. Pozole. Ah, sí, sí. La comida. Aquí no venden en el pozole, ¿no? We were just hiking out here. This is the end of the day for us. And we noticed, we smelled smoke. And we noticed up here, this is a, a fire. We have been talking to a, one of the local villagers here, an old man. And uh, this is his crop of corn you see right here. And uh, they've cleared this land out. And you can see, just from looking here, it's uh, deforested. Uh, they've really taken out a lot of the, the trees that, that should be here you know, naturally. But uh, one of the problems that, that we know exists is when people start coming into the to the habitat of the lizards, uh, or the animals, and uh, in this case, can't blame the people, they have to make a living. This is what they, they do to, to, to survive, really. And so he's growing this corn. He lights his fire so that the smoke will deter animals from coming in and eating this corn. That's the reason they do it. Uh, but you can see as a result, this massive oak tree, which I don't know how old it is, probably a couple hundred years old, is now gonna die because the bark all the way around the tree has burned off. And the tree needs that bark underneath to suck up the moisture. That's how it survives. Uh, and without that bark, it's gonna die. And unfortunately, this is such a large tree and it's actually covered with bromeliads. It's a perfect habitat for abronia, but it's gonna be gone. Uh, by this time in three months, this tree will be down. So that's too bad. But uh, that's kind of the circle of life here. You've got people on one hand who are poor and need to do something to survive, and you've got the habitat that's shrinking. And so uh, it's kind of sad to see, but that's part of what happens in this area. So just something we thought we should point out. Chilpancingo, which is a uh, it's a small kind of a small city, about two hours south of Mexico City, and this is a herpetarium. Uh, it's kind of a makeshift herpetarium. This is Rafael Aguilar's uh, little location where he's got his animals, and um, he's it's kind of the way you do it here in Mexico is you just work with what you have. So some of these animals are in small confined spaces right now. But uh, he's, they just built him a new herpetarium. He's going to move everything in there in the next 
few weeks. So uh, he's really looking forward to that to get these animals into a better situation for them. But uh, one of the things he does have that we have not found yet in the wild is he's got an abronia. So we'll have a look at that. And it's the one that we are looking for today, which is abronia Martin del Campo. So it's a really nice, it's a very interesting looking lizard. And we'll get that here on, on film here in just a minute. There's a few things that might be interesting to look at in here. We've got a beaded lizard. There are beaded lizards in this area. Rafael's been keeping them for 20 plus years. He has one particular animal that he's had for 23 years. And, uh, that's a baby that he produced last year. It's now sub-adult. And then Rafael is back here and you can see some of his other animals. And these are, this is a small, you can see it right there in the tub. This is a small venomous snake. Tropical lowland tropical, probably from Costa Rica or Nicaragua, somewhere in there. Really beautiful. I don't know if you can see the yellow That's coloration. Cola prensil. Uh-huh. Yeah. Has a prehensile tail. And that's just how they look in the wild. Rafael's really, uh, really accomplished with breeding reptiles. He knows what he's doing here. So he's been doing this for his whole life, pretty much. Now this is a venomous snake, but it's not deadly. It would definitely hurt to get bit by one. But uh, there's no record of fatalities from an eyelash fight. There's another one up here, if you want to look at it in the, in the cage. I don't know if the glare will work, but different coloration, same species, just another coloration. This is the elusive Abronia Martin del Campo. Probably never been seen on on video footage. And we're really fortunate that Rafael had one <laughs> that we could see. He has this one registered with the uh, government here in Mexico, so he has permits to keep this. And he's had it for a year and a half. And you can see on the underside here, it's got an orange underbelly. Doesn't really want me to show that off. And this is a male. You can tell it's a male because look how wide the head is there. And the unique thing about this particular bronia is you can see the scales there are really large by comparison to other bronia that we've seen. Beautiful animal though. Really unique. Well, there you go, that's a Bronia Martin del Campo. In some of the villages uh, where we were today driving around asking about him, uh, the people refer to him as a scorpion. The name in Spanish that they use is Scorpion de Arbol. They think that they're venomous. Uh, in reality, they're not poisonous at all. They're harmless. Uh, this one doesn't seem inclined to bite at all. But if it were to bite me, it wouldn't cause any problems. It just hurt a little bit. I'm not really excited to get bit by it. Okay. 
Well, see, at least there's moisture under the rocks. Good. I know this uh, this thing here, this little snake bag on my head, doesn't look too sexy, but it is keeping the sun off my neck. Believe it or not, it's cooler with this thing on. I think my dark hair absorbs the heat from the sun. Pretty sure. Mm. Probably not going to find an abronia under these rocks, <sighs> but it's a good shot. We'll find something interesting. We could find a young abronia. Sometimes they crawl and hide under things. At this point, the abronia are kind of skunking us, so maybe we try a few rocks. They're all dried out. Those are dry. Like these guys are cutting wood here probably in the last couple days. This wood is fresh. Freshly cut. So one of the things you look for when you're in the field trying to find reptiles. Right here. I don't know if you can see that on the top of the rock. That is lizard excrement. that means there's a lizard somewhere nearby might be under a rock judging from the size of that it's probably a medium-sized lizard maybe six seven inches long it's either a scoloporus or uh, probably some kind of alligator lizard uh, maybe a garanotus or a mesaspis or uh, could even be a baricia we have all three of those out in this area so I'm gonna flip some of these rocks and see if we can come up with something Here in a uh, high forest, this is a cloud forest. It's almost entirely oak, which is great. This is one of the best environments I've seen yet for Abronia. And you can see these trees that are around here are covered in bromeliads, which is the perfect environment for Abronia. The one we're looking for here though is green. It's an Abronia graminia. So it's still an arboreal alligator lizard, still lives up in the trees, but it's different color and maybe has some different behavior. Hopefully we'll find one here pretty soon. Um, best way to find them is climb up and kind of peek in the bromeliads. You can see I got a really nice one here that's got a bloom on it. There's better humidity in this area and the temperature is just right. So hopefully we'll find something. Roberto up here just climbed a tree and was looking in a bromeliad and he found our first abronia. Finally, finally after four days. Unbelievable it took this long, but we're gonna see what it looks like here. This is abronia gruminia, 
and uh, we're very excited to finally make a discovery here this morning. So why don't you see if we can bring it down, we'll get some pictures of it. Well, we just saw Roberto climb up in the tree there. He found this beautiful little lizard in the bromeliad, and you can see why they're so famous here. The coloration is really unbelievable. Bright green, you can see the yellow around his eyes. This is a juvenile. I took a close look at the tail base and the head structure. I think it's a male. That's my best guess. But uh, just a great looking little animal. And these guys eat insects. They are good for the environment here because they take out a lot of mosquito larvae and these bromeliads and bugs, uh, spiders. So they're just a nice little ins insect eating lizard. You can, you can see this one has uh, a nice green color, grass green. That's typical of this area. That's what they would look like. You can also see they're adapted to the trees. You can see he's holding on with his tail. They've got a prehensile tail, so he uses that like a fifth leg. And I don't know if you can hear what I'm saying because the wind just picked up. <laughs> We've got some wind in the area, but this is what we were after. This, this trip has been a success now for me because we were able to film an Abronia in the wild in its environment. Not an easy thing to do, for sure. We spent four days trying to get a shot of an Abronia in the wild, and this is the first that we've been able to find. So one of the misconceptions about Abronia here by the local people is that they actually have venom, or that if they bite you, you'll somehow get sick. Some people actually think you would die. And that's a problem because the local people here, if they find these lizards, they typically will kill them. Uh, just because they're afraid of them. But as you can see, this guy here, see how he's ready to bite? I'll just let him bite me. And we'll, I can show you. See, he just nipped. He let go. He didn't bite very hard. And even if he did bite hard, for him, hard doesn't hurt me. But there's no venom. You can barely see a to tooth mark on that one. Some of the bigger ones hurt a little more, I'll be honest. <laughs> but uh, no venom whatsoever. These things are perfectly harmless. So we're going to go ahead and let him back on the tree now. If we think about conservation of abronia, my emphasis would be on three areas. Uh, number one would be protect the habitat. The top priority in this area would be old growth oak trees. Because really that's where the abronia are found in the highest densities. And uh, pressure from agricultural expansion, like uh, corn crops and cattle grazing land, those are the kind of things, uh, even coffee, those are the areas that are, that are really having an impact on taking out some of these pristine old growth oak forests. And we even saw this a number of times when we were out in the field uh, on, the, on the couple of trips that we took to Mexico. Um, charcoal production is also another area that clears out forests. Uh, and of course, just harvesting timber, these basic, uh, basic elements are, are all combining to create kind of a big and unfortunately harmful impact to abronia habitat. Uh, the best thing that we could do in my mind would be to establish protected areas to preserve some of these forests. Abronia could be uh, considered kind of an icon for uh, niche cloud forest preservation similar to uh, say the red-eye tree frog is for uh, lowland jungle conservation efforts in Costa Rica and other areas. I think the abronia is, is such a beautiful and, and unique animal. Uh, it could be used as, or it could be kind of the poster child, if you will, for, for efforts around protecting cloud forests, which is a unique and, and a niche habitat that uh, definitely has need right now of being protected. 
my favorite concept, and it's and it's a realistic scenario, would be to buy land as a reserve and have locals be in charge of keeping and maintaining it and uh, rescue and relocate abronia that have been knocked out of their native habitat through some of these inevitable uh, growth and expansion areas that I've talked about with with uh, forestry and farming and charcoal production. But this would establish a, a protected haven, if you will, for the animals where a viable population could thrive in a natural ecosystem for generations. And in order for this kind of uh, scenario to work, there would need to be an economic component in place that would encourage locals to, to participate. And this could be achieved by allowing a, say, a small-scale captive breeding project in situ where a small percentage of the captive produced babies could be taken and raised uh, to an age where they're uh, more stable and uh, durable enough to be exported, for example. And these captive produced animals could be used to supply institutions uh, as well as dedicated reptile keepers and breeders and aficionados like myself around the world. And that would provide the economic component that's needed to ensure long-term success of, of such a project. In fact, uh, Mexico is actually pretty progressive in their creation of laws and, and regulations for managing wildlife. And the ba basic concept that I've outlined here and talked about is, is already in existence in their system of law today. It's just not very well known and to my knowledge, it's not really being implemented for Abronia specifically or cloud forests in general. And it's one of the goals that, that we have in mind, uh, me and, and some of my herpetologist friends. So, uh, you know, at least somebody will be working on that in the future, we hope. So those are some of the thoughts uh, that I have on the first priority, which is habitat protection. The other two areas that I would say are important to conservation of the species would be education and then captive breeding. So uh, under the topic of education, I would say locals need to know that abronia are harmless and somebody has to take some responsibility to educate them, whether it be posting signs in local habitat or, or other methods, but somebody has to educate them about the fact that these are not venomous animals, they don't need to be killed on site because that's what's been happening. Uh, the other area that, that would be critical on, under education would just be helping locals to understand that these old growth oak, the large trees that are in their backyard, have uh, an important role in the ecosystem for these cloud forests, in, in particular for some of these uh, creatures, uh, bronia and, and other frogs, there's other animals that also use these, these niche habitats. It'd be better if they could target, say, a pine tree or smaller young trees that wouldn't have as much impact if they have to clear land or if they have to uh, harvest wood. So that'd be an educational area as well. And then the bullet point that I'd say falls under conservation efforts which is needed, captive breeding. Good example here would be in the, in the situation where uh, I was talking to Jonathan Campbell who's a well-known herpetologist and writer, has contributed a lot of scientific articles uh, on the on the subject matter of abronia and he and a group of uh, scientists went out they discovered a new species abronia frosty as they described it in guatemala they went back to that same location a few years later and found that the entire forest had been wiped out where those animals were found now it's it's my argument number one that uh, habitat would have been great to to protect obviously but uh, number two, if they had uh, had the foresight to, to collect some animals and create captive assurance colonies from that initial visit, then that, that species wouldn't be presumed to be extinct uh, today. And uh, this, this just illustrates the, the fact that captive breeding does have a role and, and could be an important aspect to conservation of the species. And in fact, it could supply the demand for animals to zoos and other dedicated reptile aficionados, thereby reducing pressure on the wild populations. And in fact, I've produced F3 or third generation of Bronia vasculensilosis, so I know that it can be done 
and they can be maintained and even thrive in captivity when we've established and, and learned some of the basic uh, husbandry and protocols. And I could also cite numerous examples of, of captive reproduction efforts that have ensured a species survival into future generations with other animals. Uh, look at the American alligator or uh, even blue dart frogs from Suriname, the Dendrobatus azureus, which are produced now in, in good quantities in the uh, reptile trade. So uh, that's just a few thoughts. Wanted to summarize on conservation that I think would be important to highlight.